Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another reading wrap up. I think I somehow went three weeks instead of two weeks without doing this. Um, that was just a thing that happened. Anyway, I've got a bunch of stuff to talk about today and I will try to do this in a relatively concise manner because I am hungry and I want to go eat breakfast but I want to get this done first. <laughs> bad life choices perhaps. I'm going to start with the couple of books that I'll be talking about in other videos, so I'm just going to mention them quickly here. The first is of course The Relentless Moon by Mary Robinette Kowal. This is the third in the Lady Astronaut series, which I describe as historical science fiction, and I've already done a standalone review for this one. I really loved it. It was another great book in the series for me, but it just was a, a completely different reading experience and it elicited different reactions from me from the first two books and so I had to kind of like get over how different it felt to me before I could like really get into it and start enjoying it and then it was just wonderful. So yes, one of my few five star reads of the year so far. Another book that I'll be doing a separate review on is A Swastika Night by Murray Constantine. That book that I kept putting off reading for a couple of years because I thought it was going to be really really difficult. Um, this book does talk about some pretty disturbing stuff. Um, it is about how the world would be if Nazi Germany and Hitler won World War II and the Thousand Year Reich was actually like the Thousand Year Reich. Um, it's basically about a society that glorifies violence, brutality, and warfare and has uh, reduced women to essentially animal status. Yeah, um, the saving grace of this book for me was that it was actually very well written and it brought up some good points about human psychology and behavior and stuff and I, I ended up actually liking it um, while I still found it to be difficult to read. So yeah, uh, more rambly thoughts about this one coming in a separate video. And also I finished Filter House by Nisi Shaw. This is a short story collection that won the Otherwise Award and I will talk about it more when I do a wrap up of multiple Otherwise Awards winners. I'm in the middle of a couple more and hope to do a batch wrap up by the end of this month. Cross your fingers. Um, so this short story collection, I really enjoyed it and I was so happy that I did. I've had varying experiences with Shaw's fiction and especially like short stories in the past, but I've enjoyed their nonfiction and essays a lot more. And so I was actually kind of surprised that I super enjoyed a bunch of the stories in this collection. It's mostly outright fantasy and science fiction, and yeah, I think a couple stories from this are definitely going to stick in my mind, which is usually the sign of a good collection for me. All right, moving on to the other things now that I will actually be talking about in more detail. Um, first up is probably my favorite nonfiction book of the year so far, and that is The Disordered Cosmos by Chanda Prescott Weinstein. I've talked about this before in like a book haul, and I think on some of the Stitch and Bitch live shows and stuff like that. Um, I just really loved and like needed the perspective of this book. Um, Chanda Prescott Weinstein is one of the few black women with a PhD in physics in the United States. And this book is, I, I think the, the thing that makes this cohesive is it is her perspective, her experience of science and the scientific community as a black woman facing a lot of challenges and obstacles and everyday aggressions that basically white men don't have. And she kind of dissects how a lot of physics and the, and the, the concepts of physics and how people talk about it and everything are really shaped by Western male thinking. And that's not the same way that she thinks or that other people of color and women and other uh, gender identifying people see the world as basically. So I, I loved that perspective. I really enjoyed her voice as well. I thought she was a really good writer and she blended kind of explaining concepts very well with talking about these things that are very emotional that she's very passionate about and that are very deeply personal to her. If there's any flaw to this book perhaps, it's that I'm not sure it knows exactly what it wants to be. It starts off feeling a lot like a popular science nonfiction book actually explaining concepts of physics and then it moves more into like memoir territory, much more deeply personal about her life. And then it turns also into this kind of like call for change in the scientific community. And so 
I, I really don't know what to describe the book overall as. Perhaps it's better to approach it as a series of essays because I think a lot of the material in the book comes from essays and, and articles and stuff that Prescott Weinstein had published before. That's what I'm kind of guessing. So I just, I, I loved what I got out of this book and I so deeply appreciated seeing the way that science is done and how the scientific community and academic scientific community works from her perspective, which is not the dominant perspective or narrative in the sciences. I, we need more books like this, basically, is what I'm saying. So I super enjoyed this. If you really enjoy a lot of popular science nonfiction, I think this is a good one to pick up to kind of balance perspectives a little bit. Next up, I read a young adult fantasy novel called Deep Light by Frances Harding, and I enjoyed this one, but I didn't find it to be particularly original, especially with kind of the, the plot structure and the character arc in it. Um, I read this with some friends and we discussed it and a lot of us actually agreed that while the world building and the, the writing of this book was magnificent, um, the actual plot was not that different from things we'd read before. So this follows a young boy, I think he's actually about 14 in the story, his name is Hark, and he lives in this like um, island nation called the Myriad, which had previously been like terrorized by their gods, like these deep sea creatures that continually ravaged the islands but also helped them and the, the priests keep the gods at bay. And then there was this calamity where the gods fought each other and then died. And now during Hark's lifetime, they're kind of salvaging parts of the gods' bodies. They call it godware and it's kind of like their technology. It has particular properties. Um, and basically, Hark finds this thing in, in the sea, and his really toxic best friend pulls him into using this, this piece of godware to change things, and there's like this, this threat of the gods coming back. It, it's a, it's interesting at kind of that higher level, the story of the, the gods who are both like wonderful but terrible. Um, but what actually happens with Hark as, as a young man and, and his storyline, it was felt very typical hero's journey in a lot of ways. Um, I think one of the best things to come out of this book for me was the overall message about toxic friendships and toxic relationships. There's the the really obvious example of Hark with his his friend Jelt, who is horrible and aggressive and very much like emotionally abusive and manipulative towards Hark, but Hark feels like he owes him because like they keep saving each other's lives. They're orphans in a really tough situation. But then there's this overall um, situation of the people of the Myriad who were kind of in a toxic relationship with their gods as well. And I just thought that was a really interesting theme to tease out of the book overall. Um, so it's it wasn't amazing, but it was actually interesting to discuss with other people, so I will give it that. Um, I absolutely love Harding's writing. Her prose is just so wonderful. She manages to just capture her worlds and express them so beautifully. I really need to read more by her and I suspect that Deep Light is perhaps not, um, I don't want to say like it's her worst thing, but I have a feeling that some of her other books might be more impressive, let's say. So yeah, I will, I will read more by her in the future, especially when I'm in the mood for it because I feel like a lot of her books have this darker edge to them and I have to be in the right frame of mind for that. After that, something like completely different, I read Act Your Age, Eve Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is the third and probably final book in the Brown Sisters series. This is all contemporary romance. Um, the first one in the series was Get a Life, Chloe Brown, which I really enjoyed. The second one is my absolute favorite. That one is Take a Hint, Danny Brown. And I have to say that unfortunately, through no fault of its own, uh, Act Your Age, Eve Brown isn't my absolute favorite. I thought it was quite delightful. It was really fun to read. I zoomed through it in pretty much an entire day. 
and it was fun, but it just didn't hit me the way that the two previous ones, especially Danny Brown's book, did. So Eve is the youngest of the sisters, and she's kind of flighty. She just flits from one opportunity and one job to another. She can never really settle down on anything. It's not sure, like, what does she actually want to do? She's basically living off of her trust fund and just taking lessons and doing odd jobs. And her parents give her an ultimatum that she has to have a job for a year, get her own place to live. They're gonna cut her off from her trust fund until she figures some stuff out. She rushes off, she's very upset. She applies for a job as a chef at a B&B &B, and then hits the owner with her car and ends up staying on for like a trial period to help him out because he's got a broken arm and he has nobody else to help him. And eventually sparks fly between them. I think that the reason this one didn't quite hit the level as the other two books for me is that I just, Maybe Eve Brown as a person, like her personality isn't quite my favorite thing. Um, I liked her and I really enjoyed her journey to discover what's been going on with her inside. Like what does she really want? What makes her happy? Why has she been behaving the way that she has? I really liked her coming to, to the right conclusions about how to, you know, go forward with her life. Um, but her and the, the romantic interest, Jacob, I was just like, okay, you're fine together, but I'm not like super, super feeling it. The love interest in the story, Jacob, is autistic, and he first comes across as kind of like uptight and controlling and like way overreacting to Eve's, I don't know, flamboyance, perhaps. Um, I, I came to like him a lot more as the book went on, um, as his backstory comes out more and explains a lot about how he behaves and how he reacts to things. So, so yeah, it was a fun read and I'll probably come back to this series again when I just need more escapist feels. It's been really good to read over the past couple of years with difficult stuff going on and I'm super glad that I discovered Tali Hibbert's romances because they just they work really well for me. Everything else I have to talk about today are comics, and I will start with the just sort of random standalone one. It's called Taproot by Kizzy Young. I just came across this on Hoopla and decided to read it, and I liked it. It was very cute and very queer. Um, it is about a gardener, Hamal, who can see ghosts when most other people cannot, and he actually has struck up friendships with a lot of the ghosts around him, including this one young man whose name I'm forgetting, but they have a thing for each other. And then something weird starts happening to the ghosts. They get, like, pulled away into this like dark forest thing. It's like there's some sort of impending doom and like what, what's happening to them? And things proceed from there. Like I said, it was very cute. It was very queer. I really enjoyed the art style as well. It just, it had this pretty atmosphere. It was also not plotted very well. Um, like it starts off as one thing and it ends in a completely different way and the transition point in the middle is like super weird. So basically like there's this really big problem initially and then when the characters learn what the problem is, they come up with the solution off the page and just jump to when it's over. It's like, okay, you actually skipped over solving the problem. It, it actually made me think that I had like accidentally skipped over like a whole chapter or something in the story. It was very odd. So not the best plot points perhaps, but it was still a fun read and I'm, I'm glad that I read it. I hope someday that Kizzy Young comes out with more comics because I would read them and yeah, cute. <laughs> Next is A Sender Volume 3 by Jeff Lemire and Dustin Nguyen. This is a sequel series to Descender, which was a science fiction dystopia in many ways. I think I originally called Descender like baby BSG back in the beginning. I enjoyed Descender a lot and decided to continue with A Sender because I, I enjoyed it and I really love the artwork by Dustin Nguyen. However, after Volume 3, I think I might be done because I just don't get it. I don't care. <laughs> it's like, I think there was like a 10 year time jump in between the events of Descender and the beginning of Ascender, and it flips from being a science fictional world to being a fantasy world. Like now the problem is that there's this like evil sorceress who's using magic to control the galaxy and they're having to fight her with magic. And it brings back a lot of the characters from the first series as well as introducing some new ones. And I just don't have any feelings about it whatsoever. 
I, I don't know why, but reading this I was just faintly bored, so I think I'm going to leave it for now. I'm interested if other people who really enjoy Descender have the same feelings about Ascender, because I, I feel like I'm kind of alone and just not getting this one. <laughs> Next up is volume three of Witch Hat Atelier by Kamome Shirahama. I have started to really enjoy the story of this manga series much more with this volume. I previously said that it was really beautiful. It just has stunning artwork you can see on the covers. It's so, so pretty. Um, but I wasn't very impressed with the, the, the writing, the storyline in the first two volumes. It was very typical little girl wants to learn magic, something happens, she gets to learn magic and, you know, her education and the, the various students that she meets along the way and becomes friends with. And in this volume, it becomes much clearer that there's something darker going on and that kind of a, like, um, exiled faction of witches are perhaps trying to use Coco, the little girl, for something nefarious. And also the guy on the cover, this is Kifri. He's um, Coco's teacher who takes her in. And there's perhaps a darker side to him hinted at as well. I just felt like overall it stopped being so just like sickly sweet and cute and started to get into some serious darker stuff happening in the world and the tension ramping up a little bit. So very happy that I've stuck with it and I'm excited to continue on with the series now. And lastly, over the past couple of weeks, I just binge read the rest of Why the Last Man by Brian K. Vaughn. I read volumes four through ten. <laughs> Um, so this is a science fiction dystopia series about how a virus instantaneously kills all men and all male mammals in the world, and, except for one man and his male monkey, and they set off on this journey to find out why they survived when all the other males did not. So the first half of this series is roughly this man, Yorick, traveling across the country from like Washington DC to California with a government agent named Agent 355 and a scientist named Dr. Allison Mann. They're headed out to California to Dr. Mann's like backup facility where her research data is, where she's going to study Yorick. The second half of the series is then kind of like international where they head off to like Australia, Japan, and France to pursue more leads, more clues, and to find people. And this is like pretty much the definition of adventurous comic for me. It was really engaging. I kept wanting to read it. Things were always happening. There's a lot of humor in it as well. Yorick is, he starts off as just like this really immature man-child with a penchant for like amateur magic tricks and stuff. And he's literally got a monkey. <laughs> and over time he grows up somewhat and has to confront some difficult things about himself and his own his own feelings about being the last man and the pressures on him and and all of that. There's some really dark stuff that happens in this because, you know, lots of people die and then they keep dying. Um and yeah, like I I enjoyed reading it. I also have massive problems with a lot of the subject matter in this. I mean, I think just overall, for a story about how just like all that's left are women and like the absence of men, this like the artwork in this and a lot of the situations in the story just completely objectify women and women's bodies. All the women are so sexualized and initially I thought that this was going to be used as like making a point. And no, it just continues on and it's like, I'm sorry, four years after a calamity, women are not going to be running around in skimpy tank tops and, you know, cut off jean shorts all the time and like burying their boobs because it gets cold and you want to wear more clothing. Like, ah, uh, I could rant for so long about this. I'm not going to. There's also some pretty offensive stuff that I think it's like dated language and stuff about like um, lesbians, homosexuality. There's a lot of like transphobia in this as well. There's some like really horrible stuff said about trans people and it just started to get to me. And then at the end, I don't want to spoil things, 
but I literally hit like a rage boil point in the last volume because a major character is killed and it was so freaking cliche. It made me so mad. Despite all of that, the series managed to hit some really good points. It managed to bring up some good commentary about the relationship between the sexes and, you know, women and, and all of this stuff. But I don't think it was enough to overcome a lot of my continual irritations with some of the insensitivity of the writing and some of the, just the, the sexual objectification of the women. I just, nah, you know. Um, it, I think I think what could summarize a lot of my complaints is that this is a story mostly about women and people of color and also a lot of queer people that's written by a straight white man. And I think that really shows. You know. So I do enjoy a lot of Brian K. Vaughn's work and I'm very glad that I finally read this series because I think it was fun and worth reading. I just wish that I didn't have so many complaints about the constant irritations after the fact, but whatever. I read the thing. And that is pretty much it for me. I don't know what I'm going to be reading now because I've blasted through like a whole bunch of the comics on my Hoopla favorite list and now I gotta go like read some novels. <laughs> Such hardships, you know? But anyway, that is pretty much it for me this week. So let me know if you have read any of these things I've talked about today. Leave me a comment down below. Thank you as always for watching and I'll be back very soon with another video. And until then, bye.